Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I will, uh, I will start with a recap of our discussions, including our assessment of the outlook for the economy and the judgments we, we made in our, about our interest rate policy and our balance sheet. I will cover the decisions we made today, as well as our ongoing discussions of matters on which we expect to make decisions in coming meetings. My colleagues and I have one overarching goal, to sustain the economic expansion with a strong job market and stable prices for the benefit of the American people. The U.S. economy is in a good place, and we will continue to use our monetary policy tools to help keep it there. The jobs picture continues to be strong, with the unemployment rate near historic lows and with stronger wage gains. Inflation remains near our 2% goal. We continue to expect that the American economy will grow at a solid pace in 2019, although likely slower than the very strong pace of 2018. We believe that our current policy stance is appropriate at this time. Despite this positive outlook, over the past few months, we have seen some cross-currents and conflicting signals about the outlook. Growth has slowed in some major foreign economies, particularly China and Europe. There is elevated uncertainty around several unresolved government policy issues, including Brexit, ongoing trade negotiations, and the effects from the partial government shutdown in the United States. Financial conditions tightened considerably late in 2018 and remain less supportive of growth than they were earlier in 2018. And while most of the incoming domestic economic data have been solid, some surveys of business and consumer sentiment have moved lower, giving reason for caution. We always emphasize that our policies are data dependent. In other words, as economic conditions and the outlook evolve, we take that new information into account in setting our policies. We are now facing a somewhat contradictory picture of generally strong U.S. macroeconomic performance alongside growing evidence of cross currents. At such times, common sense risk management suggests patiently awaiting greater clarity an approach that has served policymakers well in the past. With that in mind, I'd like to spell out how the Federal Open Market Committee has been thinking about these issues. At our December meeting, we noted the solid outlook for steady growth, vigorous job creation, and price stability. We also stressed that the extent and timing of any rate increases were uncertain and would depend on incoming data and the evolving outlook. We therefore said that we would be paying close attention to global economic and financial developments, and assessing their implications for the economic outlook. Today, the FOMC decided that the cumulative effects of those developments over the last several months warrant a patient wait-and-see approach regarding future policy changes. In particular, our statement today says, in light of global economic and financial developments and muted inflation pressures, the committee will be patient as it determines what future adjustment, adjustments to the target range for the federal funds rate may be appropriate. This change was not driven by a major shift in the baseline outlook for the economy. Like many forecasters, we still see sustained expansion of economic activity, strong labor market conditions, and inflation near 2 percent as the likeliest case. But the cross currents I mentioned suggest the risk of a less favorable outlook. In addition, the case for raising rates has weakened somewhat. The traditional case for rate increases is to protect the economy from risks that arise when rates are too low for too long, particularly, particularly the risk of too high inflation. Over the past few months, that risk appears to have diminished. Inflation readings have been muted, and the recent drop in oil prices is likely to push headline inflation lower still in coming months. Further, as we noted in our post-meeting statement, while survey-based measures of inflation expectations have been stable, financial market measures of inflation compensation have moved lower. Similarly, the, balance, the risk of financial imbalances appears to have receded, as a number of indicators that showed elevated levels of financial risk appetite last fall have moved closer to historical norms. In this environment, we believe we can best support the economy by being patient in evaluating the outlook before making any future adjustment to policy. Let me now turn to balance sheet normalization. 
Over its past three meetings, the FOMC has held in-depth discussions on the final stages of this process. Today, we made some important progress in clarifying the path forward, as summarized in the statement regarding monetary policy implementation and balance sheet normalization that we released with today's FOMC statement. The Committee made the fundamental decision today to continue indefinitely using our current operating procedure for implementing monetary policy. That is, we will continue to use our administered rates to control the policy rate with an ample supply of reserves so that active management of reserves is not required. This is often called a floor system or an abundant reserve system. Under the current set of operating procedures, as outlined in the implementation note released today, this means that the federal funds rate, our active policy tool, is held within its target range by appropriately setting the Federal Reserve's administered rates of interest on reserves, as well as the offer rate on the overnight reserve reverse repo facility without managing the supply of reserves actively. As the minutes of our recent discussions have indicated, the FOMC strongly believes that this approach provides good control of short-term money market rates in a variety of market conditions and effective transmission of those rates to broader financial conditions. Settling this central question clears the way for the FOMC to address a number of further questions regarding the remaining stages of balance sheet normalization. The decision to retain our current operating procedure means that, after allowing for currency in circulation, the ultimate size of our balance sheet will be driven principally by financial institutions' demand for reserves, plus a buffer, so that fluctuations in reserve, man, reserve demand do not require us to make frequent, sizable market interventions. Estimates of the level of reserve demand are quite uncertain, but we know that this demand in the post-crisis envir environment is far larger than before. Higher reserve holdings are an important part of the stronger liquidity position that financial institutions must now hold. Moreover, based on surveys and market intelligence, current estimates of reserve demand are considerably higher than estimates of a year or so ago. The implication is that the normalization of the size of the portfolio will be completed sooner and with a larger balance sheet than in previous estimates. In light of these estimates and the substantial progress we've made in reducing reserves, the Committee is now evaluating the appropriate timing for the end of balance sheet runoff. This decision will likely be part of a plan for gradually reaching our ultimate balance sheet <coughs> goals while minimizing risks to achieving our dual mandate objectives and avoiding unnecessary market disruption. We will be finalizing these plans at coming meetings. The process of balance sheet normalization is unprecedented. Throughout this process, we've attempted to lay out our plans well in advance, and we've been willing to make changes as we learn more about the process. The implementation and normalization statement released today is intended to provide some additional clarity regarding the conditions under which we might adjust our plans. The statement makes three points. First, as we've long emphasized, the federal funds rate is our active monetary policy tool. Second, as far as the particular details of normalization are concerned, we will not hesitate to make changes in light of economic and financial developments. This does not mean that we would use the balance sheet as an active tool, but occasional changes could be warranted. Third, we, we repeat a sentence of the normalization principles we adopted in June of 2017. While the federal funds rate would remain our active tool of policy in a wide range of scenarios, we recognize that the economy could again present conditions in which federal funds rate policy is not sufficient. In those cases, the FOMC would be prepared to use its full range of tools, including balance sheet policy. Times of economic uncertainty put a premium on the clarity and predictability of FOMC policy. We are committed to clearly explaining what we are doing and why we're doing it, both regarding the path of rates and also regarding management of the balance sheet. We believe that this transparency is how we can best contribute to macroeconomic stability. Thank you. I'll be glad to take your questions. Howard. Hi, uh, Howard Schneider with Reuters. So you've said uh, many times recently that policy was still accommodative and then it needn't be so. Uh, it, you, you've said recently that policy, the state of the policy was still accommodative and that the economy didn't require that anymore. Is that still the case? Uh, if so, how do you justify the removal of the need for some further interest rate increases? Basically, are we at neutral now or does the, 
economies still need accommodation. Uh, we, we think that our, uh, our policy is, is at the appropriate point right now. We think our policy stance is appropriate right now. We do. We also uh, know that uh, our policy rate is now in the range of, uh, of the committee's estimates of neutral. Uh, so we'll be, uh, we, we, again, we think our policy stance is, is appropriate. Heather Long from the Washington Post. Um, last week, the IMF said risks are clearly skewed to the downside for the U.S. and global economy. Can you clarify, does the FOMC see risks as skewed to the downside, particularly after you remove the statement about risks being balanced? We had a <clears throat> an extensive discussion of, uh, of the baseline and also of the risks to the baseline. And the risks are, uh, of course, the fact that financial conditions have tightened, that uh, global growth has slowed, as well as some, let's say, government-related risks like Brexit and trade, trade discussions and also the uh, effects and ultimate disposition of the shutdown. So we, looked at, we look at those, and the way we think of it is that policy, we will use our policy, and we have, to offset risks to the, to the baseline. So we, we, uh, we view the baseline as still solid, and part of that is the way we adjusted our, our, our baseline to address those risks. So that's the way we're thinking about that now. Uh, thanks, Sam Fleming from the Financial Times. Um, <clears throat> the Fed has linked its commitment to patients in part to subdued inflation outcomes. Um, would you be comfortable with continuing patients even if there are modest, if transient, overshoots to the uh, inflation target by core inflation? Uh, how, how sensitive are you right now to developments in core inflation when determining the next move? Thanks. You know, uh, generally speaking, um, we think the, the outlook is favorable, um, uh, and we think that these cross-currents that I referred to, these risks, are going to be with us for a while. We think our stance is appropriate. We think there's no pressing need to change our policy stance and no need to rush to judgment there. Um, I would say that um, we'll be looking at a full range of data, uh, and that will include inflation data. It will include all data relevant to our, our dual mandate of, of stable prices and maximum employment. Remember that our, our uh, inflation objective is a symmetric one, meaning that we are, uh, we're always trying to get to 2 percent, and we don't look at, uh, we look at inflation equally on, on both sides. So I can't get into specific hypotheticals, but uh, I do believe that we have a symmetric objective and we'll, I believe we'll act that way. Um. We, read from, we learned from the last minutes of the <coughs> meeting that um, well, some of the tweaks you make to the statement have a lot more portent than we thought. Um, in light of that, I'm wondering if you can provide us with a decoder ring uh, <coughs> for, for this statement. Um, adjustments, does that suggest the next move in interest rates is as likely to be up as down? And when you twin in light of global economic and financial developments with muted inflation pressures, does that suggest you have to see both the cessation of these cross currents that you've talked about and inflation moving up before you uh, uh, get off the uh, dime, so to speak, and move? Sorry, say again what the first question was. First question is adjustments. Is that ah, meant to yeah. imply it's the next move is as most, most likely to be up as down? Yeah, so I, I, I'm just going to say that the, it's going to depend entirely on the data. We're, we're not making a judgment. We don't have a strong prior. We, We'll be, we will patiently wait and let the data uh, clarify. Some of the, um, the cross currents that I referred to may be with us for a while, and I think uh, we'll be looking at uh, seeing those clear up as it relates to, as they relate to the outlook for the U.S., and that'll be an important aspect as well. Your second question was? I mean, would it not just the cessation of those cross currents, but this, the uh, end of these muted inflation pressures, is, is that, are they both sort of things that are necessary for you to uh, change this patient's stance? You know, it, it's, it's really hard to, uh, to speak it about generalities. We'll be looking at everything, but I, I do think that, um, you know, muted inflation pressures, uh, uh, you know, you would want to, I would want to see uh, a need for further rate increases, and for me, a big part of that would be inflation. It would be the only thing, but it would certainly be important. Steve, and then Nick. <clears throat> Steve Leisman, CNBC. 
Mr. Chairman, did the committee discuss an actual change to the runoff policy or the runoff uh, schedule right now? Uh, if so, if not, if, if, is that under consideration right now and when might we know? The second thing is I have to nail down this thing. You guys, Fed folks, keep mentioning the market average or the market outlook for the size of the balance sheet. Are you endorsing the market average, which is three and a half trillion? And if you're not endorsing it, why do you keep mentioning it? Okay. Um, so today I'm here to talk about decisions and also discussions about decisions that haven't been made. So with, with we're talking about the latter thing, which discussions, and so I can't get ahead of where decisions are. But um, so the committee is, what we're looking to do is create a, a whole plan that will bring us to our goal, our longer run goal, which is a balance sheet no larger than it needs to be for us to efficiently conduct, efficiently and effectively conduct, conduct monetary policy, but to do so in a way that doesn't put our goals at risk or result in unnecessary market turmoil. So there are a lot of pieces to that, and, and we've learned over time that it's when making these, when designing these plans, like for example, the original normalization plan, it's good to take your time, let the best ideas rise to the top, let them stand the test of time and argument, and then move when you're really comfortable with what you've got and when you feel you can communicate it clearly. So I don't want to get ahead of that process uh, today. But so um, we've discussed, there, there are a number of pieces to, to that puzzle. There are several different pieces to them, and I think they're coming I'm very pleased at the progress that we've made. Um, and you know, the piece that you mentioned is something that is, that is in those discussions. That's the first question. Um, we're, I'm not going to give uh, our estimate or ratify anybody else's estimate of what the equilibrium balance sheet is here today. There are estimates out there, where, but I'm not at a, at a point today where I'm going to be giving out numbers on that. But there are, there are estimates, and I think they're consistent with what I said, broadly speaking. So just to clarify, I'm sorry, um, you did discuss reducing the pace of the runoff. That sounds like what you said today. Yeah, it, it's so, again, we haven't made any decisions. There are no decisions have been made, but uh, as uh, there, there are different pieces of the thing, and that, that is in the discussion. That is one of many pieces that is in the discussion, and that, that was reflected in the last minutes, actually. Thanks. Uh, Nick Timoros of the Wall Street Journal. Chairman Pell, uh, I want to follow up on Steve's question. The size of the balance sheet obviously matters a great deal, but so too, if you follow the arguments that were made when the Fed was purchasing these assets, does the duration of those holdings. So once you, are, once you reach the terminal level of reserves and, and you have to reinvest maturing mortgage-backed securities into treasuries, uh, it'll matter a great deal, of course, where along the curve the Fed resumes those reinvestments. And so I wonder, what does your staff research show about the degree of accommodation that would be provided by either moving to the front end of the curve and holding over investing perhaps in shorter maturity assets versus the other approach that was identified in the December meeting minutes, which would be to uh, simply reflect uh, issuance uh, of the outstanding treasury maturities. And which approach do you think is more appropriate in the current environment? These are great questions. Let me say that um, the, the question of, of the ultimate composition of our balance sheet in the longer run is a very important one, and it's one that we see ourselves as coming to, you know, fairly soon, yeah, as, as in incoming meetings. It won't be the first thing we, we work on, but it'll be one of the first things that we try to resolve. We've had, we had discussions at a, one of the last two meetings on this, and we haven't come to a, we haven't come to a judgment on that, and I, you know, I, I wouldn't comment beyond saying that we understand that's that's a key question, and there are there are you know there are uh, issues to be decided. There are benefits and costs to doing to taking different approaches, and I, I wouldn't want to prejudge them today. Daniel Applebaum, New York Times. I, I'm struggling a little bit to understand what has changed since we sat here with you six weeks ago. Uh, you've said today that you think that inflation would be the reason that the Fed would need to continue raising rates. Has the inflation outlook shifted that dramatically in the last six weeks? Can you speak specifically to why you've moved from a posture of saying we expect to keep raising rates this year uh, to a posture of standing still? So I point to a couple of things. <clears throat> First, um, the, the narrative of slowing global growth con continues, if you will. The, the incoming data have, have, have shown more of that. We've seen that both in China and in Western Europe. 
And so that's an important, that has important implications for us. And that, that story has, let's just say it continues. And uh, in addition, um, I mean, I, I think important, possibly less important now, probably less important now, but has been the shutdown, which, which will leave some sort of imprint on first quarter GDP. We don't know the ultimate resolution of it. If, if, if that's all there is and the shutdown is gone and, and there isn't another shutdown, then we'll get most of that back in the, in the second period, but, but second quarter. So those things. In addition, you know, the, you, you, you have to look back. Financial conditions began to tighten in the fourth quarter, and they, are, they now have persisted and remain tighter, significantly tighter, let's say, than they were. And that's something that we have to take into account as well. So that's where we are. Michael McKee from uh, Bloomberg Television and Radio. Um, you said you like to be a plain speaker, so let me try to uh, have you put this as plainly as possible. Is it fair to characterize this as uh, not a pause in a tightening cycle, but the end of the tightening cycle now, uh, a new regime uh, for the Fed? And if not, can you put a time frame on patient? Does, does patient have some sort of time frame? And I'm wondering about uh, your reaction to the criticism you got on Dece uh, your December 19th news conference, your later statements, uh, do you feel you've put a foul put into the markets? Um, so patients, uh, I, I think we're, we're going to know in hindsight because the, the, the length of this, um, this patient period is going to depend entirely on incoming data and its implications for the outlook. So that's going to be the, so it's hard to say, you know, it's hard to think of what to call it at this point or, or how to label it. Um, so it, it, really your question, your second question is about how do we think about financial conditions? And I, I would say this, um, we think about a broad range of financial conditions, not just one or two things. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's interest rates, it's risk spreads, it's currency, it's, it's the stock market, it's, it's credit availability, it's many, many factors. And what matters for financial conditions is when there are changes, and those changes are sustained for a period of time, then they become important for us because they have important macroeconomic implications. So that's how we think about it. So we, we, we don't react to, um, you know, to most things that happen in the financial markets, but when we see a sustained change in financial conditions, then that's something that has to play into our thinking. In fact, our policy works through changing financial conditions, so it's sort of, a, it's sort of the essence of what we do. Guido with Politico. Um, I just wanted to ask, first of all, um, about whether the Fed is gathering information about um, some of the new money laundering information that's come out about Deutsche Bank and Danske Bank and whether you have any concerns there. And then also, I was just wondering if you could say whether um, there's any kind of timeline on when the Fed might make a decision on um, real-time payments and whether you're going to build a real-time payment system. Right. So on the, on the first question, I, I can obviously, we don't, we don't comment on, uh, on individual investigations uh, or whether they're happening. Um, I will say that uh, um, we take our enforcement powers very seriously and we, uh, we put them to work when we feel it's justified. In terms of real-time payments, um, it's something we're very actively working on. As you obviously know, we have, a, we have some proposals out and we're considering them. You know, the, the thing is, uh, it's very important in that space to consult with the full range of market participants and interest groups, consumer groups, and we've done that, as I'm sure you know, over a period of years. We don't have plenary authority to just do things for the most part in, in the payment space. We've been more of a convener, bringing industry and the public, public interest groups, uh, and all those groups around the table. And we've, we've, I think we've played a constructive role in that respect, and I believe that will continue. Thanks, Jim Cusingero with the LA Times. Um, you and your colleagues may have noticed President Trump for the past six months has been urging the Fed not to raise rates, to stop raising rates. How would you respond to those who would suggest that the Fed just caved to the President's demands? So what, what we care about, and really the only thing we care about at the Fed, is um, doing our job for the American people and using our tools appropriately. So that's very strongly our culture. I think anyone who, who knows the Fed or who has worked at the Fed would, would recognize that description. So we're always going to do what we think is 
is the right thing. We're never going to take political considerations into account or discuss them as part of our work. Um, you know, we're human, we make mistakes, but we're not going to make mistakes of character or integrity. And I, I, I would want the public to know that, and I would want them to, to see that in our actions. Uh, Edward Lawrence from Fox Business News. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The um, long-term federal funds rate is 2.8 percent. I've talked last year with a number of Fed presidents who worry that under 3 percent is not enough to handle the next recession. You say that's your first tool, so it's your primary means of adjusting monetary uh, policy. So with a larger balance sheet, with a larger balance sheet, could you, how could you handle that next recession then with the combination of those two? I guess the sense of your question is that we, we, well, we, we could be in a situation in the future, we hope not, but we could be in a situation where uh, we'd like to cut rates more than we can effectively and we hit the zero lower bound. We don't think anything like that is, uh, is, is in the cards now. There's no reason to think that it would be. But as we said in today's release, if that happens, then we'll use the full range of our tools and uh, that includes the balance sheet. But we would use it after using our conventional tools, which would be the, the interest rate and forward guidance about the interest rate. Even if you have a, a large balance sheet, four trillion above four trillion. Yes, yeah, there would there would be um, uh, there would be room to do substantially more. Uh, Chairman Powell, Donna Borak with CNN. Um, I just wanted to go back to you had mentioned on the cross currents the government shutdown issue. Um, you mentioned a couple of weeks ago that that information would clearly show up in the data. I'm wondering, um, as you guys discussed during this week's meeting, what the potential economic impact would be of the shutdown, the possibility of a second one, whether or not it would diminish consumer confidence, have some severe ripple, ripple effects. Just talking to other folks outside um, businesses, clearly they were suffering and seeing a lot of pain. And just wondering about for American families that missed two paychecks, how is this going to play out for them for the months to come? Right. Um, so let me give you the, the economic side of it first, is that um, even with a fairly long shutdown, as long as that's the end of it and everyone gets their back pay, except the contractors, uh, I guess, the private sector contractors, but some people get, get their back pay, then, then the lost GDP will be, will be regained in the second quarter. So. That's, that's that. I, I would say that the, you know, we all see the suffering and the, and the heartbreak and, and all the pain people go through. I see, um, you know, federal employees doing, doing their work and I'm, you know, really grateful they did. I mean, to, to be doing, doing your work while you're not getting paid, it's something we should all be grateful for. Um, did that answer your, both your questions? So, so would there would there be a permanent effect? As, as, I, as I mentioned, there, there wouldn't be if there isn't another shutdown. If there were going to be a permanent effect or, or a lasting effect, let's say, it would be from a longer shutdown or perhaps a second shutdown, and that would be through the channel of a loss of confidence in, in our ability to make policy in the United States. That, that would be the channel of that. And I think that was something that we and many others were, were worried about as there was talk of, a, of an even longer shutdown. Um, in terms of ideas for not having more shutdowns, I know Congress is actually looking at some of those, so I think that could be a profitable thing to explore. Marty Kretzinger, AP. Uh, the beige book that was prepared for this meeting uh, uh, noted a, a rising concern among business contacts about a higher uh, trade tariffs and the tensions there. Did that play a part in the discussion? And, and uh, the, the decision that you made on shifting of, of the wording in the statement? You know, so trade, uh, uh, you sound like you're an avid reader of the Beige Book, and that's great. <laughs> uh, the uh, trade, as you, as you will know then, the trade has been a big feature in the, in the Beige Book for some time now. We, the Beige Book is, our, is a collection of all of, our, uh, of the comments that our Reserve Bank presidents get from their district. It's incredibly valuable because you're getting actual reports from people who are on the line. And there have been real concerns about trade right along the line, both in terms of availability of, of materials and costs and, and things like and retaliation abroad and that kind of thing. Um, so that, that's been a concern. I would say the, the longer-term concern, though, is, um, is uh, 
the negotiations that are going on uh, is if, if they linger, then there, there could be more and more uncertainty and you worry over time that, that that could have an effect on business confidence. So far, the actual amount of tariffs that have been applied both here and in China is not enough to have material effects on GDP either here or in China. So the, the concern is more a longer drawn, for me, a longer drawn out set of negotiations back and forth which could, which could result in sapping business confidence. Uncertainty is not the friend of business. And Nancy Marshall Genzer from Marketplace. I want to talk to you about corporate debt. Um, are you worried that by taking a pause and raising interest rates, we've had low interest rates for so long, are you contributing to a bubble in corporate debt? So we, we did, we've, um, we've called out uh, corporate debt as a risk, it's more of a macroeconomic risk, I think, than a financial stability risk. Um, the sense of that being that if you have companies that are highly levered and we do go into a downturn, they're going to be less able to weather that and keep serving their customers and, uh, you know, may have to do layoffs and, and things like that, which, so they can amplify, in effect, a negative downturn. So we watch that. We also watch carefully for the exposure of the financial system to these companies. In other words, banks are arranging a lot of these loans. The question is, what, what is their exposure? Do they retain big pieces of the loans? Do they have do they have obligations to underwrite loans, which, which build up in a pipeline? So we monitor those risks very carefully. And I, frankly, the banks monitor them much better with our support and help than they did before the crisis. So it's a, it's a concern. It's something that we're watching. Of course, you know, November, December, and January were, were much slower months for those sorts of things. But, um, you know, it, it'll be something that we're always paying close attention to. Chairman Powell, Greg Robb from Market Watch. Financial markets have reacted strongly to the decision and the press conference. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is up more than like 500 points. There's a sense in the market that you've, that there's a, a new, you know, what people call the Powell put on the markets. Are financial markets wrong in, in that assessment? You know, I, I would point to um, all, the, all the continuity here. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing we did on the balance sheet is, uh, is something we've been working on for, frankly, years, the thing we announced today. Uh, and um, so we're providing clarity there. I think that's a constructive thing to do. I, my honestly only motivation is to do the right thing for the economy and for the American people. That's it. And uh, this situation, I think, calls for patience. I think it does. And it's just um, the stance of policy we think is appropriate. We see these uncertainties, and we see uh, a time when we can afford to, that we have the luxury of being able to wait and watch. And that's what we're planning to do. And I, I think it's the right thing. I feel strongly that it is. Uh, Chairman Powell. Uh, sorry about that. The uh, Office of the Comptroller of the Currency last year uh, completed its FinTech charter, um, and one of the questions around that charter has been whether the Federal Reserve will uh, allow such a charter or such a chartered bank to access the payment system. Um, I'm curious if uh, you think the FinTech charter is a good idea in general and what conditions you think might be necessary to allow the Fed to allow such a chartered institution access to uh, the payment system. I, you know, I'm not going to be able to help you much on that. Those are, those are great questions and those are questions that are, uh, you know, that I, are, are great supervisory people. Are, are looking at. Um, I think we're open to these ideas, but I, I, I don't have any, any uh, news for you on that today. <clears throat> and then Mark. Ah, Steve Beckner, freelance journalist reporting for NPR, Mr. Chairman. You've echoed the widespread concern about slowing growth in China and elsewhere in the world. Uh, but I wonder whether it's possible that slower growth abroad might actually be beneficial to this country in some respects, at least. Uh, for example, perhaps uh, increasing capital inflows and uh, uh, putting downward pressure on long-term rates in this country, as happened in the Asian financial crisis of the late 90s. You know, Steve, it's certainly possible. Um, ultimately, 
though, uh, you know, a strong global economy is good for us. The, we export to these countries. We trade with these countries. Um, I mean, part of the story of 2017, for example, was that U European growth kept coming in stronger and stronger, and that meant the euro was strong, and that, that supported our exports. So ultimately, I think we benefit from, from having uh, strong growth abroad, although y you point to an interesting case. Chairman Powell, Mark Hamrick with Bankrate, thank you. Uh, as you probably heard, the Congressional Budget Office is projecting the federal debt is expected to surge to about $29 trillion over the next 10 years, reaching the highest share since the end of World War II. First of all, does that sound like it could be a reasonable forecast with the administration seeming to take uh, plenty of opportunities to question the uh, legitimacy of CBO. And then secondly, what effect does that have on interest rates and the public, if indeed that's even close to being true? Um, so first, it, it is important. We don't, we don't do uh, fiscal policy. We don't advise the government or Congress on fiscal policy. So I'll limit myself to more high-level comments and say that it, it is, uh, is not a secret. It is a, a long-known fact that the U.S. federal government budget is on an unsustainable path, and that needs to be addressed. And uh, that is driven principally by the combination of health care costs, really due to our health care delivery system, and the aging of the population. So, and there's no time like now when the economy is healthy, growing, people are working, to go after that problem. Ultimately, we will have to. Um, we don't have a forecast. We don't forecast those things. I have no reason to doubt CBO's numbers on this. I haven't actually looked at that report, but uh, my general experience with them is that it's a, it's a professional outfit. So what does that look like if that really takes place one years down the road? So, uh, you know, there are, first of all, our, the work that we do relates more to the medium term rather than the long term. And so I, I don't see this in particular as a threat to this business cycle or to the economy this year. It's more in the longer run, we'll be spending all of our money on, on uh, paying interest and not on the things that we really need to be doing for future generations and for our own generation. So it's, it's a serious problem, but it's not a problem that is, is something that either helps or prevents the Fed from doing our job today. Hi, Chairman. Paul Kiernan from uh, Dow Jones Newswires. Um, I, I know where the FOMC participants' estimates for uh, the long run uh, interest rate are. Um, they're all above 2.5%. Um, right now, we're between 2.25 and 2.5. So, um, you know, I, I think a key question right now is um, is policy accommodative at, at this moment? Um, are we looking at, at, at staying accommodative for some time, or um, has your estimate has your estimate of, uh, of neutral come down um, in light of the recent volatility in markets? Thanks. So the, the range of estimates on the committee uh, starts at two and a half percent, and that's kind of roughly where where we currently are. And as as I said uh, a couple times, um, when you get to that range. We, we, you know that we can't directly observe the neutral rate. We only know it by its works. And, and so we have to put aside our own priors of what that rate might be and let the data speak to us. So we can do that. We're, we're, we're in the range. Uh, there are a number of committee members who are, you know, right around that range. And I think, uh, I think we're watching to see. We don't, and I, I don't, uh, I, I don't, I, I think, again, I think that our policy stance today is appropriate for the state of the economy. That's my my, my feeling, we're going to be watching data to see whether that's right, and we're also going to be watching data to see how these cross currents resolve themselves and how the, how the U.S. economy performs this year. Thank you. Virginie Monte with Agency France Press. Um, among the global developments uh, that the Fed is monitoring, how much of a risk for the American expansion would be the prospect of a hard Brexit? So um, we, we are mon we've been monitoring the Brexit uh, situation very carefully for a long time. And for us, that starts with U.S. financial institutions that have a presence either in 
the UK or in the EU or both. So we've, we, we have worked with those institutions alongside UK and EU regulators to assure ourselves that those firms have plans and have liquidity and have all the things they will need to deal with the full range of Brexit outcomes. So we've, we've done a lot of work on that and uh, generally speaking, um, again, a lot of work has been done. You have to be humble and say that this is an unprecedented event. So, uh, so that's the, but that's the financial, uh, the financial system aspect of it. We, um, if there is a, if there is a hard Brexit, then that would very likely involve disruptions both to the continental economy and certainly to the UK economy, and we would feel that. Um, the question would, for us, it, w it wouldn't be a huge first order thing, the economic effects, unless, uh, unless you saw financial disruption. So if you, if you saw financial turmoil and that kind of thing, that would be the, that would be the way it would reach us. I would expect that uh, that we would feel some of this, and it, it's very hard to have uh, great confidence that you know what that would be. But it, it, it would be it would be something probably not probably not material to our economy, but it's something we'll be watching very carefully, and, and certainly hoping that, that that there is a resolution short of of a hard Brexit. Hi, Jean Young with Market News. Um, I have a question about the ultimate size of the balance sheet. Um, how will the Fed judge what is a reasonable level for financial institutions' demand for reserves um, when it appears to be rising at a fast pace over the past year, and perhaps at a faster pace than can be explained by regulatory changes during that same time frame? Would you prefer to err on the side of being more <coughs> generous, or would you try to encourage banks from holding um, to hold less reserves? Let me be clear. I, I don't know that, that um, demand for reserves has risen over the past years. I think our understanding of demand for reserves, remember that the banks have, have more reserves than they, they need. Reserves are still quite abundant. So the question is how much of that amount is actually going to be needed in the end after, you know, after the firms adjust to, adjust to our very gradual decrease. And so our understanding, really, of the distribution of reserves and how much will be needed has, has moved up over the past year. And then there would, there would be a buffer on top of that, and then we would, we would want to be um, – we want to have a buffer, as I mentioned in my remarks, because we, we want to we be oper operating in an abundant reserves regime where we operate through our administered rates. If you operate too close to that point of scarcity, then you wind up having to have these big ongoing interventions in the market. We don't want the Fed to have – a, you know, a large ongoing presence in the market around this. We'd rather just, uh, you know, met to, in managing the federal funds rate, we'd rather have it set by our administered rates. So that, that implies you'd want to be a bit above what that equilibrium demand for reserves is. And again, there's no, there's no cookbook here. There's no playbook. No one really knows. You, the only way you can figure it out is by surveying people and market intelligence and then ultimately by approaching that point quite carefully. We don't take this, you know, we don't think we have a precise understanding of this at all. I want to be clear about that. These estimates are, are fairly uncertain. So if you think that, that if you think that the uh, level of abundant, uh, level of demand for reserves is here, it probably, it's probably somewhere, that all you can say is probably somewhere in this range. If banks want to use reserves for good and sufficient reason, which is to say to hold liquidity as we require them to do to meet the liquidity coverage ratio, to meet their resolution requirements and resolution planning. We're not going to discourage them from holding them. They are, in fact, a very safe asset, in a way the safest asset, and we want the banks to be safe and sound. We didn't create the reserves, you know, with that in mind, but, you know, s since in, in the post-crisis, you know, regulatory regime, we have brand new and quite substantial liquidity requirements, which are, which are very good and, and which have great public benefit. So it's not a bad thing that banks hold on to these reserves or, or another safe asset. We, we don't, we're not, we're not encouraging them to hold reserves instead of treasuries. Treasuries or reserves are roughly equivalent um, for this purpose. Thanks, Courtney. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Courtney Brown from Axios. Um, a data dependency question. Um, has there been a prioritization of market data over the economic data? How do you, how do you balance those two things? 
I, I would say that you know our our, our um, mandate is maximum employment and stable prices, and that's about you know hard real side economic data. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we we our our, our tool our, our you know our, our interest rate tool operates on the economy through financial conditions. So financial conditions matter, and they matter in the way that I suggested earlier, which is to say broad financial conditions changing over a sustained period, that has implications for the macro economy. It does. So if you lower interest rates and they stay low, every borrower in, in the country ultimately has a lower interest rate. That will have an effect on, over time, an effect on the economy. So, um, but again, our, our, our enti the entire focus we have is on, is, is on maximum employment and stable prices, not on any particular financial market or, or financial conditions generally. Uh, Chair Powell, Miles Adam with Yahoo Finance. Um, I would just ask, I, I guess, about the balance sheet in general, and are you surprised at how much of a conversation uh, we're having around the balance sheet and how much talk about the balance sheet from yourself and various Fed officials have moved financial markets? Because putting out a statement clarifying your view on the balance sheet um, you know, is somewhat surprising considering it is restating you know, what the Fed had said all along was the goal with balance sheet normalization to you know, roll it off, not have it be a key part of policy. Um, and so I would just ask, are you surprised by kind of how far that conversation has gotten just in the last six weeks? You know, I'll quickly go back. In 2017, we were, in designing the normalization plan, we were concerned at, uh, at not having two active tools of policy. We learned during the taper tantrum, frankly, in 2013 that that, was, that would be confusing to markets. So what we did was uh, we set up the, um, the normalization of the balance sheet in a way that was very transparent so that you could look and, and know, really, certainly as to, as to treasuries, pretty much the exact amounts and the timing in which we would be returning these assets to private hands. And we put that out there very publicly and in the, in the hope that it would be priced in and understood and that then we could put the balance sheet on the side and have interest rates be the, the active tool of policy. So um, that, that went along that way very well. And I think that, that division of labor was, was a good one for, for our policy and for the benefit of the country. Um, I think that there's, uh, um, I think the market is now uh, looking for more clarity around, around that, and I think it, it will be providing it. That's, that's what's happened. Thank you. Thanks very much.